Hi guys. So today I want to talk about processes that are driven by uh, multiple Brownian motions. So let's first consider um, n-dimensional Brownian motion. Uh, n-dimensional Brownian motion is written as wt is equal to w1 of t comma w2 t wn of t. Okay. So basically it's a vector of n one-dimensional Brownian motion. So basically it uh, n dimensional Brownian motion is nothing but a vector of n one-dimensional Brownian motions. Okay, n one-dimensional Brownian motion and all of these Brownian motions are independent of one another. So if i is not equal to j then w i of t and w j of t are independent. Okay, so we basically uh, have a n-dimensional Brownian motion. N-dimensional Brownian motion we said basically is composed of n one-dimensional Brownian motions, and all of these Brownian motions are independent of one another. Okay, associated with this Brownian motion we have a filtration. Okay, so if we have two points in time, zero is less than or equal to s less than t, then a sigma algebra at time s, basically all or, or the information available at time s, all the sets in this sigma algebra are also in f of t, okay? Secondly, Brownian motion is basically f t measurable, okay? And if we consider an increment of our n-dimensional Brownian motion, Wt minus Ws is independent of information available to us at time s. Okay? So again, basically, our n-dimensional Brownian motion is composed of n one-dimensional Brownian motion, and all of these Brownian motions are independent of one another. We have a filtration, and basically, uh, our n-dimensional Brownian, Brownian motion is ft measurable, and these increments are independent of information available at time s. Okay, now since these are individually one dimensional Brownian motions, we can basically write down the quadratic variation of each of these Brownian motions. We know that the quadratic variation of a Brownian motion gets accumulated at one per unit time, which we can write as dW i of t times dW i of t is equal to one times dt. Okay. This basically comes from the fact that each one of these is basically a one-dimensional Brownian motion and we know that Brownian motion accumulates quadratic variation at one per unit time, okay? We can also calculate what are the cross variation. So we can also calculate what are the cross variation W i of t times d W j of t. And this I'll just show you that this is equal to zero. provided i is not equal to j and these Brownian motions are independent of one another. Okay, if these Brownian motions are independent of one another, then the cross variation is going to be equal to zero. And I'm going to show you that result in just a moment. Okay guys, so now I want to calculate what is the cross variation. Um, so basically the cross variation is denoted by wi comma wj at time t, okay? And in order to calculate the cross variation, what we can do is we can partition time into n number of time steps. So this is t0, this is t1, t2, all the way to t of n. So we're basically partitioning time into n number of time steps. And then the cross variation, let's denote this by c of pi, is given by k equals zero to n minus one, and we can look at the increments of this Brownian motion, w i of t k plus one minus w i of t k, okay? Multiplied by w j of t k plus one minus w j of t k, okay? So this is how we calculate cross variation. If you remember, we've actually talked about this many times uh, before. Now what we want to do is, you know, in order to calculate this cross variation, we basically want to make sure that we calculate this 
as the largest time step basically goes to zero. The largest time step you're going to denote by double mod of pi and this is going to be max of tk plus 1 minus tk. 0 is less than equal to k is than equal to n minus 1. Okay? So this basically is the largest time step that we basically have here. And we want to actually calculate this as double mod of pi goes to zero. Or we make the largest time step. As that basically largest time step goes to zero, we basically want to see what this converges to. One approach we can take is we basically can take the expectation here. We can calculate what is the expected value of C of pi. If we take expected value of this, we'll get expected value of k equals zero to n minus one of this whole thing here w i t k plus 1 minus w i t k w j t k plus 1 minus w j t k okay now since these are independent of one another okay i can take the expectation inside and this can this will become expected expected value of this multiplied by expected value of this right since they are independent of one another and since these are in Increments of a Brownian motion, we know that expected value is equal to zero. So this whole thing basically goes to zero. Okay, so expected value basically goes to zero. Now if I want to calculate what is the variance of this, variance is nothing but E of the square minus E of C of pi whole square. We know that expected value, just we saw that it's equal to zero. This basically goes to zero. This becomes C of pi square. Okay, so variance of this is basically is equal to expected value of c pi of uh, c square of this. And we can basically square this term right here first and see what we get. If we square this, this basically is the summation of all of these terms. So if we square them, we're going to get sum of squares. Sum of squares can be written as k equals 0 to n minus 1 w i t k plus 1 minus w i t k this square times w j t plus 1 minus w j t k square this basically is a, is the sum of squares and then we basically also have the cross terms which we can write as summation all the way to n minus 1 let's introduce l less than k this then becomes w i t l plus 1 minus w i t l w j t l plus 1 w j t l multiplied by w i t k plus 1 minus w i t k times w j t plus 1 Okay, so we have, we basically, we wanted to calculate C, the square, square basically is given by sum of squares plus all sum of the, the cross term, which basically is written here. Now in order to calculate the variance, we want to take expected value of this, so expected value of this basically becomes expected.